This is Henry. Henry is a resident at Cobble Hill Nursing Home who suffers from symptoms of dementia. He's been in the home for over 10 years now and is almost totally nonverbal. He doesn't speak much and severely struggles to recall the names of his own family, which is a typical symptom of dementia and Alzheimer's. You may recognize him if you saw this viral video a few years back or the documentary Alive Inside, a story of music and memory. In this film, they took the time to perform musical therapy on nursing home patients like Henry by simply allowing them to listen to music from their youth in hopes that it would aid in memory retrieval and spark some nostalgia. For Henry, the treatment looked like this. I, I would sing with this. You can if you like. Shortly after this little jam sesh, he was answering questions about the music he grew up with, songs he liked, and how they made him feel. In this short five minute interview, he probably spoke more words than he had in the past five days leading up to that moment. And this was the common response in all of the elderly featured in the film that suffered from Alzheimer's or any form of memory loss. Husbands and wives reunited, stories from the past resurfaced, and life brought back to the faces of the seniors that listen. I'm crying. Music has a very powerful, almost magical ability to bring us back to a place or a feeling from the past, even in those that have severe memory disabilities. It's no wonder that something as simple as the theme from Halo, the sounds of the great sea, or the prelude to Final Fantasy can bring you right back to those nights when you stayed up until sunrise at a LAN party, or cartwheeled into your room with a copy of Wind Waker because they finally had one in stock to rent at Blockbuster. And that beautiful feeling of being transported back thanks to music is what I'd like to dissect today through the lens of memory encoding and retrieval. I'm Daryl, this is Psych of Play, and in a world where pretty much every game analysis channel has made something on video game music, join me as we add another one to the pile. Except in this vid, we're going to look at it from the perspective of cognitive psychology, encoding, retrieval, and Alzheimer's. And if anyone's already done that, well, I've already made the thumbnail, so... <laughs> I think we all understand the idea of games training us to associate a certain song with a particular moment or emotion. All you need to do is play this track every time a guardian notices Link in Breath of the Wild and you can condition the music itself to signal danger. You can surprise the player with this track when they happen to run into one of those sweet legendary doggos in Pokemon Crystal. When this music hits you feel some relief and know you've done something right. You hear this music, you simply panic and start scoping out potential windows to throw your controller through. These types of associations happen because our hippocampus, the main memory processing center of the brain, begins to notice that the music and events in the game are repeatedly happening at the same time and are likely connected. Therefore, remembering the sounds with the event is advantageous, so they are encoded together. It's the same thing with all senses. Our ancestors got sick when they ate food with a certain smell, and today our brains recognize that smell as rotten. We also associate certain colors and shapes with caution, because that's what we've been taught. Typically, our hippocampus notices these patterns because of repetition. Every single time you are in a particular scenario, the music plays. But what about those soundtracks in a game that maybe only play once or twice for a limited period of time, but still stick with you? There's no real importance in the context of the game's mechanics in the song Undertale from Undertale, yet it's continually regarded as one of the game's most memorable soundtracks. Of course, you'd remember this soundtrack from The Witcher because you hear it every time Geralt finds himself in danger. But what about songs like Confronting Myself from Celeste, which only plays during the showdown with Badalyn? Why would the hippocampus choose to store these tracks to long-term memory even though they aren't repeatedly paired to critical gameplay information? Well, the hippocampus isn't alone in deciding what information gets encoded to long-term memory. Its trashy next-door neighbor, the amygdala, also has quite a bit to say when it comes to what's important. 
The amygdala is the emotional processing center of the brain, and several studies have found that music can influence the amygdala in some pretty profound ways, which in turn influences how the hippocampus encodes information to long-term memory. A study published in Nature in 2014 found that music that creates pleasurable emotions lights up the amygdala and the mesolimbic pathway, one of the four dopamine pathways that generates the feelings of happiness in the brain. And this may come as a shock to you, but as it turns out, our brains like to be happy. They enjoy that rush of dopamine that comes from music, those little delinquents. And just like your brain prioritizes not dying in Zelda because it keeps you happy, it prioritizes the feel of emotional music and the moments connected to them because that also makes you happy. When music strikes us as moving, our amygdala jumps in and says, hey, hippocampus, two things. One, Shorten your name, it's obnoxiously long and it vexes me. And two, always remember how dearly beloved goes. It makes me feel things, and I like that. But the amygdala isn't alone when it comes to emotional music. Sometimes there truly is a pattern that the hippocampus picks up. Because in a lot of cases, that music we think we've only heard one time, we've actually heard before in a different form. This is called leitmotif, and happens when a subtle theme in music is associated with a particular person, idea, or situation, not necessarily a game's mechanic. My boy Matthew Dyson has a great series on this and Final Fantasy on his channel GameScore Fanfare that you should definitely check out. Anyways, the song Undertale is just a mashup of the theme from the intro sequence, and his theme. Which is only teased in the game once or twice. Together, these themes combine to create that strange familiarity and make you feel that your journey is coming full circle. Final Fantasy X does something really similar with its intro sequence that my man Tom O'Regan pointed out in his video on intro cutscenes. Leitmotif, especially with tunes that are super emotional, is simply a more subtle version of the game mechanic musical association I mentioned earlier, and works due to something called context-specific learning. Our minds are more likely to recall the visuals and ideas that were present at the time of encoding if the current music or environment matches what was present at the time of encoding. In other words, a song will remind you of whatever you experienced when you first heard it or first got familiar with it. This use of leitmotif and association is also applicable in movies, and Disney uses it a ton to make you feel like you're gonna cry and not fully know why. Like at the end of Up when they sneak in a gentle piano version of the music from the opening scene with Carl and Ellie. Award you the highest honor I can bestow, the Ellie Badge. Sideways has a great video on how Pixar does exactly this, and boy, a lot of shoutouts today. I just, I guess I just gotta send some love to the creators that inspire me, and like I said, this is a really, uh, really popular topic. But what's fascinating to me is just how far reaching some of these associations can go. Like, think about how that live action Mulan trailer really wasn't doing it for you until the music swelled, and you realized it was an instrumental of the song Reflection. And suddenly, you were a 10-year-old girl in your PJs again, singing along with Mulan on the VHS. You might have had one of those cool TVs with the VCR built into the bottom if your family was bougie, but either way, you definitely didn't rewind the tape before you put it back in the box. In reality, Dr. Wily's theme is just a melody. To most people, it's just another good song. But to you, it could be a part of who you are. It could sound like your childhood. And this is the really long-term association stuff. Nostalgia that sticks with you for years, and sometimes, even a lifetime. It's important to note that the music being played for the seniors in the Alive Inside documentary was from very early in their youths, typically from when they were below the age of 30. This matters because research has shown that between the ages of 10 and 30, your identity is under construction. 
There is a phenomenon in autobiographical memory research known as the reminiscence bump, where across several cultures, middle-aged and elderly people will typically access more personal memories from around the age of 10 to 30 years old. This period of adolescence to early adulthood appears to be where most of these strongly personal autobiographical memories are encoded, which is why the music we consume during this time is more than just the music. It's more than just emotion, it's who we are. Music we listen to during this time becomes entwined with our lives. The soundtrack for Route 30 may have become the soundtrack of your elementary school days. Jeremy Sewell may have scored Skyrim and your time in high school or college. Cab Calloway may have composed music for the Cotton Club in Harlem and for Henry's favorite chapters of life. But it doesn't stop at the reminiscence bump. I touched on this very briefly in the How to Study video from last November, but there is also a finding known as the self-referencing effect. Essentially, when any information is related to you in some way, you are far more likely to recall it at a later time. And when you pair this with the context-specific learning I mentioned earlier and the reminiscence bump, it's no wonder music is so effective in stirring up these autobiographical memories. It's one prompt that can consistently aid in retrieving information from long-term memory that is decades old. Which brings me to what I think is the most promising finding from this documentary and from other research I've found. For those with forms of memory loss, there has been a long-standing belief that those affected either can't encode and form new memories, or that old memories are damaged and inaccessible. Alzheimer's typically results in the degradation of dendritic spines in the brain, but it's never been exactly clear how this affected cognition until a 2016 study at MIT. Using amnesic lab rats that have similar dendritic spine damage to Alzheimer's in humans, Susumu Tonegawa and his team conditioned a fear response in a group of rats with amnesia and a group without it. The conditioned fear stimulus probably wasn't the drowning music from Sonic, but I like to imagine that it was. Naturally, for those with the Alzheimer's, it didn't take. However, afterwards, when they used optogenetics to beef up the number of synapses, the amnesic mice remembered just as well as the controls did. What this means is that the rats with Alzheimer's did, in fact, encode new memories. The association was getting in, but just couldn't be remembered. This has been replicated in other studies with longer-term memories as well, suggesting that Alzheimer's is a retrieval problem, not an encoding problem. And I think the Alive Inside documentary echoes this finding beautifully. The memories are there, lying dormant. And due to music's inherent association with the memories of someone's youth, the people from that time, and the emotions linked with them, it's hard to find a better supplement than a nostalgic melody. When you look at this mountain of research, you can see why. The self-referencing effect, context-specific learning, the reminiscence bump, all separate findings that support music's ability to revive the past and aid in the retrieval of autobiographical memories. And that is truly a wonderful thing. Hey there, thank you so very much for sticking around until the end of this episode. I know this one wasn't as centered on gaming as the usual show, but I really did have fun just talking about some good old psych research. So I truly appreciate you letting me try something a little different, and I hope you enjoyed it. Next month we'll be doing a deep dive on a game I've never talked about on this channel before, so be ready for that. Oh, and BT Dubs, due to popular demand, I have a Patreon now, and I'm producing some saucy monthly bonus content over there, so be sure to check out the link if you want in on that. Make sure to like the video, let me know what your most nostalgic video game soundtrack is in the comments, consider becoming my patron, take care of yourself, and have a damn good one.